three, two, one. Pete Williams, thank you very much for coming on to the Data Strategy Show, 66 Questions, Data Leaders Unplugged. How are you doing, Pete? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. And looking forward to chatting. <laughs> good, good. Listen, let's go straight into it. Um, Pete, how do you start your day? Huh. Uh, do you know what? My big obsession is coffee. So I've got myself a, a pretty decent coffee machine and a grinder and some beans. And uh -huh. every day, my absolute ritual is making uh, like a latte for me and a single um, single shot skinny cappuccino for my girlfriend. So oh, coffee making is nice. the thing that really starts my day for me. I absolutely love it. Perfect. And is that why you've got your virtual barista in your signature as well? Yes. yes that's <laughs> a great thing, yeah. uh, uh, and any particular blend that you like? Uh, I'm I'm all about artisan coffees. So uh -huh. I've seven or eight little roasters around the UK, and I just move between them as I fancy a new set of beans. So I, I, it's the new flavors and profiles that really interest mm -hmm. me. Very cool. Nice. So tell me, what would you say is your biggest strength? Um, I think probably communication. I mean, I might disprove that through the rest of this podcast, <laughs> but I think my my big strength is being able to express ideas and being able to get people to buy into those, mm -hmm. understand where the sort of strategic vision I'm placing is, and maybe trying to be able to use strong communication techniques to be able to reconcile between opposing positions or extract information. So I think the thing that the thing that I, I feel has got me to this stage is being able to talk to people and and being able to help them understand what it is we're trying to do. You know, translation between tech and business etc yeah yeah hybrid uh, and and talking to them in their own language and making them feel comfortable i'm, I'm assuming which yeah is... yeah so many people rock up and it feels like a like an ivory tower conversation based on acronyms that yep. you, the message oh, yes. you're nodding at each other across the table and you know that nothing's going in on either side and yeah. then you wonder why the system doesn't work afterwards you know? so but based on that what, what do you think has been your biggest learning experience so far throughout your career wow I mean, so many, and I, I do quite a few presentations. Highlight. I think for me, the, the thing that's most relevant around data is, uh, I, I'm super excited about this. Lots of my psychological profiling says that in extreme situations, I go to logic, uh, and logic and data are so you know closely correlated, and not everybody does that. So what I what I really understood around the 2000s when I was doing um, like a store system for a big UK supermarket is thinking that just putting data in the hands of people would automatically lead to better decisions. And what I kind of understood was, even though you're giving them better information, it doesn't mean they can actually apply that mm -hmm. to make better progress. So it's kind of understanding that lots of the value is locked up in helping people understand information. It's not just the, the technical enjoyment that are providing more granularity more often through a nicer visualization. You've got to help people turn that into insights they can actually action in their day-to-day -day decision making so that's the thing i that's the, been one of the biggest learnings for me is it's not just about the technical rollout it's about how people are going to receive it yeah and i think a lot of people call that the final mile don't they you know how are you actually going to work on that and then you know whether it's a revenue generator or it's a cost efficiency or it's just you know making a decision about your team so i i i, I think that's I just wrote about that today, actually, on LinkedIn as my final point, <laughs> which is I think it's still the big, big, biggest thing out there. But anyway, it's not about me. What's your favorite time of day? Um, this is a really challenging problem between myself and, and my girlfriend, who obviously we live together. Yep. She is an early morning person. Uh -huh. I'm a late night person. So if I'm trying to smash out a presentation or deliver a piece of work, I'm quite often mailing people um, sort of 11, 12, 1 in the morning because I find my energy comes later in the day yeah, rather than yeah, yeah. So even though I love a sunrise, mm -hmm. I, I like a sunset out there with my camera. And I really, um, you know, the evening is where I find I've got the energy. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> what's one vice you wish you could give up? <laughs> my, my word. Um, <laughs> Too many. <laughs> well, it's going to be, you know, the thing that's probably driven me on a personal basis to places I don't want to be is consumption. Mm -hmm. So you know, I love I love good food. I love um, nice wine. I, I love my coffee, as I said earlier on. And the inability to control the intake of those Tell me has led me to places where I don't want to be around, you know, my, I guess my physical shape and my mental well-being that's kind of associated to that. So yeah. I think if I, could, if I could harness my consumption and enjoy those smaller moments better, I, I, maybe I'd be, uh, I don't know, I'm not an unha unhappy person, but I'd feel like I've got more control to that's probably my the thing that I'd like to add to control most. 
Yep, I think you and I have the same issue and challenges <laughs> in that respect. I, I honestly, uh, I think you've just read my mind um, last couple of days. What what makes you angry? Um, <laughs> this is a very very specific example. At the weekend, um, you know, talking with my father about the current state of the of the UK economy, but I'm mm. not sure we want to get into that one. Right no. Now it's a bit contentious. <laughs> Um, I think it's maybe it's intolerance and right. inability to see somebody else's point of view. Mm-hmm. That, mm-hmm. That's all sort of over. Uh, the, I've worked with some part people in the past who really overbearing. It's like a one way yeah. download of messaging without any break or empathy to understand how the other mm-hmm. person's receiving that and how they might want to take part in it rather mm-hmm. than just hear it from you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think actually uh, empathy and tolerance. I think uh, which is needed more yeah. today than any, any, any other time that I've actually, um, you know, seen, I think. Yeah. Bar yeah, when I was very open, young. Mm. Being open to listening to a point of view and trying yeah. to digest that, it kind of goes to the heart of what data is mm. all about anyway, is mm. being informed mm-hmm. um, rather than being locked in an echo chamber, you know? Yeah, yeah. What would you say is your best trait? <laughs> um, oh, that's tricky. <laughs> now, I mean, who, who, who in the UK <laughs> likes to talk about the positive side of themselves? I think if I was to talk about those things that really annoy me, I would hope that my best trait is probably tolerance. Tolerance, yeah. You know, and, yeah. And, you know, hopefully a sense of humour and wanting to engage and talk and listen to people and being open to an opposing point of view, mm-hmm. um, I think would probably be my strongest trait. And I think that's probably a foundation of some of my uh, progress to date. Yeah, yeah, good. I like that. Um, what are you most excited about these days? I mean, I'm really excited about the place I am in in the sort of the data leadership career. I really, mm-hmm. I, I've, I've talked in other scenarios around how much I enjoy it, that sort of data transformation and being at the pinnacle of that, you're being at the front of it mm-hmm. um, and, and helping people, you know, watching light bulbs go on and becoming informed and making better decisions. That really excites me. So the current team that I've recruited, the current technology I'm fronting up and the, you know, the organization, the industry that I'm trying to help with that, Mm-hmm. it genuinely excites me so i think that I'm, I'm really excited about my role and my job at the moment that, that that's fantastic like, like it's horribly locked into the, being somebody else's worker drone but i'm genuinely excited about where i'm no, at. i i think there's nothing wrong with that you i can see it on your face you're genuinely you know the smile on your face is is, is infectious so no I, I can see that <laughs> and it's good to hear you know that uh that that you can be so um inspired and and compelled to do what you do which is great i think it's fantastic um <clears throat> what's the best compliment you've ever received <clears throat> uh, i think it's it was um it was about courage mm-hmm. and i'm not i'm not putting myself out there as a particularly brave person i certainly haven't been tested in some of the awful scenarios that we see in the world today but you know on my subject matter people don't always hear or want to hear what you're bringing you can be the destroyer of people's empires you know where mm-hmm. what created inside an organization is based on a legacy way of working and an understanding that no longer applies so your message isn't welcome so i think one of the nicest compliments i had was um through some anonymous 360 feedback was around courage and okay. persistence and you know being willing to have that conversation and go and approach that individual Mm -hmm. uh, a number of times to be able to work out how you could work together to solve a problem. So I I thought I took that as a really positive Mm. thing. I I was surprised to hear that it wasn't something I put against myself. No, I think, I I think that's about, I think it goes back to the tolerance piece and it probably also um, is, is an aspect of leadership in its, in of itself. You know, you have to have difficult conversations or, you know, those, those times when you just can't get through, um, either it's you or it's the other person yeah. and that's what one has to do you know understand yeah. who it is as well so I think that's actually an interesting one no one's come up with that yet <laughs> so uh, fantastic um, what makes you smile the most oh well, obviously talking to you Samir um, <laughs> definitely bringing out the smile come today. on <laughs> uh, what makes me smile the most do you know, this this is going to sound a little bit sad so forgive me but you know, the last week or so with this crazy weather we're having yeah uh, and I've been sitting outside as the sun goes down, soft lights in my garden, glass of wine in my hands mm-hmm. and a book. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've just found that absolutely enjoyable. And it 
my family moved to Italy like right. 15 years ago. And whenever I go over there, every evening is kind of is kind of like that, only with much oh. better views than I've got from my garden. Yeah. Uh, and and I can just you can just feel yourself relax and you can feel a sense of contentment. Mm -hmm. that just that just comes through that satisfying period. So I think that that's something that I'm really valuing at the moment. Wonderful. I think you I think you said it earlier, you know, mental health and, you know, just just being peaceful as well. Yeah, I guess, and, you know, nice way to reflect. Um, what's the one thing that people don't know about you? <laughs> I don't know. I've done too many of these podcasts. I suppose. <laughs> um, Be unique. Come on. This is a new podcast. No. I think um, people may not. I don't even know if it's very interesting, but people may not know um, about how much I traveled in my youth. Mm -hmm. I was in a reasonably privileged position with my father's job. Um, and he got posted abroad all the time. Very so nice. as my sister and I were growing up, pretty much every school holiday and some of the term time, because you could do that back then, mm -hmm. spent in a far-flung destination and a, and a strange and unusual culture that, you know, for, you know, sort of seven to 17-year-old UK teenagers was quite unusual. You know, mm -hmm. we, we never went to Europe. Yeah, our places were always the Far East, the Middle East. I mean, I'd, I'd only ever been to Alaska, which is probably wow. the most unusual place that people go to in the states. But it was a fascinating experience as we were young. We we spent lots of time in Kenya and Nairobi, yep. Sri Lanka, you know, um, in 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 the Mediterranean. That sorry, not Mediterranean, the the West Indies. Mm -hmm. And so I think we 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 were quite privileged to get there, not because we had money, but because that's where my father's job was. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think, you know, one of the things that just to expand on this a little bit that I worry about it, as the adverse effects of travel mm. is the lack of exposure to other cultures and yep. other ways of living. Because I think for me, it opened up my mind to how other people are doing and what's important to them, which is not always the same as yours. But you kind of realize that at the end of the day, people are all striving to be happy mm -hmm. and to be successful and to be settled and stable mm -hmm. with their families. Mm -hmm. And I think unless you go and see that and realize that no matter what people are and what you might read about them in the newspaper, this is kind of what they're all striving for, then maybe intolerance gets to creep in. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's, I think that, that travel, I think, really opened my mind to many, many things. That's a wonderful education in of itself as a, as a young child, no doubt. So, yeah, I, I think the cultural experiences, um, and I, like you, equally had a similar experience of growing up. Um, so, uh, uh, that was the one thing that my father w was extremely um, persistent about was that one should embrace every single culture, religion, whatever it yeah. is that, you know, and, and actually learn more about them than they know. They might not know. They might know about you. So I think that's a wonderful way to be. But again, it's not about me. What makes you feel most like yourself? Most like myself. <clears throat> um at the moment, being being on a podcast, yeah, I just, I very, <laughs> very much filled up myself. Um, I, I, I'm going to tie that uh, possibly to two things. One, I have this enormous obsession with Italy, and mm -hmm. I can't explain it. I don't have any okay. Italian blood, but I feel a strong affiliation to Italian things. Wow! Uh, and I, I love being over there. I was super delighted when my parents moved over there, as I said, you know, 15 mm -hmm. years ago, because I now mm -hmm. I get a regular a regular downloader of that sense yeah. that culture yeah so i i think that's one thing the other is is my subject matter you know if mm. you look at my linkedin profile i've called myself a data evangelist for a long time simply because um i really believe in this subject and yep. i'm really excited and proud to be you know somebody people want to talk to about this and so this is something by which i also identify myself and therefore when i'm standing up and i'm being a data leader and i'm talking about how to bring this to life in organizations i do feel of myself because i don't need to read off notes because this is what i do this is what i've learned yeah. and this is what i really enjoy bringing to other people it's the biggest learnings that i can share so this also makes me feel like me passionate passionate and and heartfelt which is what i what which is what i hear coming through what are the three three th what are the three things that you can't live without well i would say probably coffee one is coffee uh, yeah i got that yeah, definitely <laughs> coffee um for a long time, I thought it was um, human contact might be the strange one, but I, I was always very happy to be in a book mm -hmm. or, or if, if there's something that I'm interested in is research. But actually through lockdown, although for me, lockdown was a reasonably positive experience, 
there is still an enormous joy when you actually get together with your friends oh, absolutely and you crack open a bottle of wine you sit around you have a conversation yep. enjoy a meal together so i probably have now find that i value that more mm. than i in the past mm-hmm. um i'm not sure on another one <laughs> but that that one that one definitely okay uh, cool you know, like i didn't that. really understand before but i but i do now do, do you have a current tv character obsession I've been to quite a few TV programs recently. You know, yeah. um, I think probably like like most people, you're hitting Netflix and going, I've seen all of these things. What is yep. the next? What's next? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, the things that I always go back to and the things that I will watch any piece of like low rated mm-hmm. garbage on Netflix is around <laughs> anybody who's doing, um, you know, sort of martial arts with a sword. Oh, I yeah. Seen, I would love to be. You know, like a like a modern Bruce Lee character, a modern oh, ninja. Right. Yeah, exactly right. I, those is it Sho Kosugi? I think he used to be the big ninja actor. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nineteen eighty four. Yeah. I watched all of those ninja films. Wow. And and the, <laughs> I remember trying to research before the days of the internet. How do you become a ninja? Where do you, where can you be trained? Where's this yeah. place where you punch stones all day and, and yeah, yeah, be stealthy like a cat, but deadly like a shark or whatever? I don't know, but and I never found it, but. <laughs> somewhere in japan <laughs> i should probably stop talking about that one but um yeah that was a, a deep we, we, we'll see you on the next podcast wielding swords uh, i have tried i went to a couple of sort of uh katana based lessons oh, did you, you know? wow yeah. good for you and it's I, one of my problems and you might have a question around this is wanting to be great quickly yes yes not having the patience you know this is a bruce yeah. yeah. you know, got to master the basics in order to be able to you know to absolutely. improvise absolutely but everybody nowadays wants to get straight to the improvised mastery no, without actually dealing with how to get there. In the first it doesn't place. work. I, d- I did karate for about 14 years and I still don't think I mastered it. So it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a very, very, yeah, you, you've, you've got to stick at things like that. So, so yeah. on, on the same, on, on the same narrative, then what's the last show that you actually binge watched? Um, it was actually on Netflix. It was called Cursed. Cursed. Um, I've never of- heard of that. No, I hadn't either because, you know, yeah. searching deeper and deeper into yes. the layer to try to find something. But, um, yeah, there was that. And there was another one quite recent um, about the sort of creation of the UK, but from mm-hmm. a sort of a Danish point of view. Um, okay. Yeah, I forget what the character's name was called, which is annoying because I went around quoting it for ages. But there were five series of this, you know, sort oh. of Danish guy um, who was half, I think he was a UK guy raised by Vikings and then come back. Oh. And kind of sitting alongside Alfred as he created um, Great Britain and, and brought the uh, various areas of the UK together. So the story oh, about him, watch that. Yeah. Oh, it, it was fabulous. I'll drop you a link on it. Yeah, I yeah, please do. That. Yeah. yeah so, so what's the most adventurous thing you've done in your life? Uh, I guess it depends if adventure is daredevil or not. I don't think I've ever done anything particularly like scary. Um, the biggest adventure that I get that I set myself out on was. I think 2016 was doing the London Paris bike ride. Oh, nice. Um, you know, I hadn't ridden a bike since around 2000, 2001. Right. Um, and, you know, there was a good cause. It was a British Legion thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And some friends were doing it. It's while I was working at m and and they were kind of sponsoring this. When did you do uh, that? Sorry. When was it? 2016. And yeah, you might have done it with a mate of mine. Anyway, I we'll might have done that later. <laughs> yeah, <we definitely, laughs> yeah. But, you know, there was a buy a bike um, train. Yeah. Yeah, able to ride. I mean, it's only a hundred miles a day, which when you, it doesn't sound that much, um, but it can be if you haven't done any. You haven't trained for a long time, yeah. um, and there was quite a lot of mental toughness. You know, the end of day two, mm-hmm. it just turned into a massive rain shower. Yeah, uh, so twenty miles through unknown French oh, countries through geez. a slog. Um, but I was doing it with a great friend of mine, a guy called Keith Goldthorpe. We were sharing a room, and he was a good cyclist, and he was kind of giving me that strength, mm-hmm. power to mm-hmm. carry on. And mm-hmm. I formed other friendships out of it. And do you know what? I meant to write a leadership blog about it because the people who led it and how they got these people of enormously varying capabilities to the end point, you know, the yep. coast of the Lise, we rode down there, finished underneath the Arc de Triomphe. And the, mm-hmm. the sense of mm-hmm. achievement, you know, bike over your head type. Yeah, picture. yeah. Um, but everybody arriving there at the same time on the same day. Wow. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a great feeling. So even though it wasn't particularly like I didn't, stress myself to do something that no man has ever done before 
there was a massive still, sense still a the feat end. that's still yeah. i mean i haven't done a a bike ride between london and paris i mean it's well get out there and do it <laughs> well yeah but i'm saying it's a it's still it's a big feat it's not an easy thing you know it's no, mentally physically you know uh, your body gets hammered as well so you know people just think riding a bike is quite easy it ain't at all no, not for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how, how would you define yourself in three words old uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, maybe that's just acquired wisdom i don't know that's two words um well maybe i can use that courage thing so yeah yeah i'm, I'm courageous on on things that matter mm -hmm. um i think i've got a, a reasonable sense of humor yep and i think i'm pretty empathetic so yep. Um, I mean, that's three words. I might have added sponge-like because, you know, I do like to absorb information. I'm motivated to research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of where I am now is driven by, you know, I talked about my father living abroad. Um, he worked for British Airways. So right. a lot of time he wasn't he wasn't there. So even though my sister, my myself and my mum had gone to visit him, he wasn't there because he was servicing the aeroplanes or waiting for the next one to come in. Okay. So, um, but he used to bring home all of the books that people left on planes. So, you know, at a young oh, age, fantastic. I was exposed to everything that people left. Amazing. It didn't matter what it was. I was just consuming yeah, yeah. stories probably beyond my years and imagination yeah. and fictional scenarios that were super exciting to me. And I think what it's given me is quite a strong imagination now um, that I think when you're working in an industry like mine, being able to, play out scenarios or see mm. opportunities or understand strategies or just tell mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. I think I, I credit a lot to the yep. time I spent with my nose deep in a book at the time. So, you know, that sort of research and storytelling part, I think has given me some, some advantages. And I think that's quite a, a big part of me. Mm, awesome. What would you say is your most overused phrase? <laughs> Indeed. Um, okay, there you go. That's fine. You don't have to say anything else. <laughs> UK based Russia. Indeed. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that is currently inspiring you in the data world right now? Any specific thing? Um, I can tell you what's inspiring me to, to annoyance. Oh, yeah. The data mesh thing. Oh, God. I yeah. Really well, annoying. I didn't say what's annoying. I get so many. I think it's annoying a lot of people in a positive moment. way. Yeah, yeah, it certainly yeah, is. I just see that burying problems inside organizations. So, I think on the on the one hand, it it that inspires me, but not in a positive sense. Yeah, um, I'm sure it does work for some people, but for most mm -hmm. organizations, I think it's just a problem. Um, I think otherwise, for me, what what I don't quite understand is I've been at this for a long time now, and I. I the last couple of years, I've been thinking I'm not going to bother doing these podcasts or presentations because everybody's heard the story. Everybody's yep. on the journey. And what I'm really surprised at is how many large companies are not on the journey. You know, they haven't yet mastered uh, control of their data. They haven't yep. understood the opportunities. They haven't created, you know, CDO type roles to at least take mm -hmm. charge and try and bring it to life. So that that's something that inspires me is mm -hmm. how many people out there that still still need help i know yes. this isn't like like a vocational yeah, yeah. calling but yeah. every organization benefits from better use of data and i'm i'm always surprised how many are not yet doing I'm not it using and how it, yeah. relevant my stories that is yeah yeah i i so that inspires me to continue. i i i think that's a very valid point because i see it day in day out i hear it day in day out and going back to your research you know you can look at the last 10 years of say new vantage partners um surveys and you can really see it in that you know how how you've had a lot of ups but now we're seeing quite a few downs in in a number of areas yeah. so what's the best piece of advice you've ever received uh, there was there was a guy called john who was the project manager who well program manager really which was running the finance transformation at Waitrose when I was working mm -hmm. there. And I was in the tech side and I was building the data warehouse to support this system. And he came along and, and he said to me, um, he was surprised about the understanding and ability that I had to translate what I was trying to do technically into business language and commercial opportunities mm -hmm. and then reflect mm -hmm. those priorities back into the tech team. Yep. And he was the first person who really noticed that about me and, and mm -hmm. an idea that that might be an advantage that I had. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, he taught me a lot about project management. Um, mm -hmm. and a lot of it was around don't sweat the small stuff. Don't yep. micromanage a project. 
you know, and, and the sort of semi hands off nudge theory. Mm-hmm. So when, when we sat down to talk about me going to work for him and moving out of tech and into the into the business finance team to lead on this project, he, he said to me, what's your um, what, what's your opinion on chaos? You know, kind of are you, are you one of these people who's trying to drive order from chaos or are you comfortable with chaos? And in, in my head, the way I see this and projects, which are always chaotic, is but they've all got a journey. Yeah. And I see yeah. like a giant pinball game. Mm-hmm. And my my job and my approach to project management now is is I'm I'm the flappers on the edge trying to nudge the project forward. You know, the ball of chaos yep. in the middle going up and down. Yeah. Yep. Setting up lights and whistles and bells everywhere. It's my job to nudge that towards mm-hmm. the end point where I need mm-hmm. it to be to score points yep. rather than let it fall off the grid. And so yeah. I think his approach to chaos is something that I really took on board. And I try and tell that to my people as well. And I was like, don't try and drive every single small decision. Make sure we're going in the right direction. And you know when you need to intervene rather than intervening yeah. all the time. Yeah. Very, very good. Very, very, I mean, excellent piece of advice um, that you got there. Do, do you remember the the moment your career completely changed? It was John. I mean, it was that. Was it that point yeah. as well? Yeah, it was. It was yeah. Wow. Because if I'd have stuck in tech, you know, I'd been yeah. a programmer, I'd been a batch operator on the overnight, you know, oh my if, goodness, my and stuff. Yeah. Um, and and then I was into business intelligence and data warehousing. Yeah. All of these are super valuable, very important. Mm-hmm. And if I hadn't made the transition from tech into the into business, the business, yeah, and understood the other dynamic that goes on mm-hmm. in an organization and that mm-hmm. kind of. Um, a bit of elitism that goes on mm-hmm. between you know business and technology yeah, so yeah, they agreed. can't be very capable yeah. um, then I, I don't think I'd have been able to express commercial opportunities and understand that technology is an enabler yep. but it's not driving the organization it's not the setter of the strategy yeah, yeah. so it, uh, John changed my life basically brilliant wow well John hats off to you what makes you feel accomplished um I think, I think many things, many things make me feel accomplished. You know, small thing to this morning, nailing my latte art and getting a good pour <laughs> on my coffee, um, which you, if you have a good hit, account, you'd, yeah. you'd be like, because, you know, the, the reason I moved into coffee making away from capsules was because I'd go to Italy and then I couldn't take the beans home. Of it's course. Like, These coffees are amazing. The beans yeah. are on the table and I go home and I got a little pod with yep. a flavor somebody else has packaged up for me. And that's what oh, I can God, yeah. so I wanted to learn the craft. So the satisfaction that the, the dedication I put into learning how to put mm. a shot, steam milk, pour a drink. So that sort of small victory every morning when it goes right and you can look at it and go, that looks pretty professional. Um, then that's a massive achievement. And when somebody else says, wow, cool. your coffee's great. I yeah. love that. Um, yeah. So that's good. And I think one of the other things that I really like at the moment is looking at my team. You know, I've recruited what I believe are young, super talented mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Um, who have got loads of technical knowledge. Obviously, mine is out of date because I haven't been at the command <laughs> line, but I but I kind of understand what yeah. the does. You know, you know, you know the concepts. That, yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. right. So yeah. now I'm trying to give these deeply capable technical people and smart brains and motivated mm-hmm. individuals um, the 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 sort of business tools and leadership yeah. tools to be able to take that yeah. and and further Forward. their careers and allow them to achieve what they want to achieve. Mm-hmm. So as mm-hmm. I see them changing their behaviours and mm-hmm. having an impact on the organization now i i haven't got any kids but i find i find it quite, quite <laughs> good for you by the way yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome what's your what's your biggest regret um in some ways it was not going to university yeah um, you know i've yeah. i hit the sixth form at my school mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of had it with structured education. Okay, you know, I wasn't a massive rebel. I was yeah. just affected and you just wanted and, something different. Yeah, I was yeah. mildly disrupted, I guess. Um, and I wanted, I wanted some other form of knowledge, and, mm-hmm. and it just wasn't there. So I think through the sixth form, I was highly demotivated and didn't mm-hmm. really do myself justice when it came to the end of the A levels. And then I, I wasted some early years, um, you know, just basically going full time in my Saturday job. Right. And then a couple of years later, realizing that I was wasting my life, it wasn't going to give me opportunities that I wanted. And uh, I went for a job as a computer programmer because I'd loved, you know, as a kid, I come from the age where Sinclair Spectrum, the Commodore yep. 64, yep. all that sort of stuff. And I used to love coding. 
So I thought, well, I'm going back into that. I'm going to go yeah. back into that. And that's going to be a good career choice. So I went for a job interview and I failed miserably. I mean, I was oh, a um, And my brain wouldn't work. I couldn't do it. Oh, anything. wow. Because I hadn't used it for a long time. I've just yeah. been working in a shop, interacting with people, mm-hmm. using a different part of my of my capability. And it showed me that actually I needed to do something else. So I went back to university, did a HND in computer science, smashed through that, really enjoyed it, couldn't mm-hmm. afford to carry on and turn it into a BSc. And kind of from there is when I launched into John Lewis and, and took that um, batch operator role. Brilliant. You know, mainframes overnight. Yeah. yeah. That, that was absolutely transformational for me. Um, but if I hadn't have done that, what where would I be now if I'd have exactly. gone straight to university? If, I, if I'd have been because yeah. all of my friends did that, I'm still friends with them, you know, 40 years later, which is a mm-hmm. delight to me, that stability mm-hmm. through my life. But they've all been incredibly successful, you know. I am successful, um, they've been incredibly successful. I just wonder where I would have been if I'd been able to apply myself right at the start, yeah, yeah. taking some time to get back to you it. You had to go through your own experiences, right? Exactly, right? Yeah. You live your life, can't you? Exactly, exactly. What's heavily played on your music playlist right now? <laughs> One of my long-time obsessions has been how to be an amazing guitarist. Oh, yeah. I've got four, like, expensive guitars. Oh, wow. Okay, so. And basically two left hands. I can't play any of them. <laughs> um, but I love seeing them. And so blues oh, I love that. Yeah. is what really does me. Oh, and very cool. Stevie Ray Vaughan is probably my, yeah. my favorite guitarist. absolutely love him. Mm-hmm. And I've got a real obsession with Christopher Mills, the front man of Cooler Shaker. Mm-hmm. I've seen as Cooler Shaker disbanded and became a number of other bands afterwards as well there's just something about i don't think he's the best guitarist in the world but there's something about watching that guy and the yeah. energy he gives that um i really kind of associated with and wanted to be able to demonstrate myself so. wonderful wonderful god we've got a lot of similarities which is which is weird <laughs> um what three things are at the top of your bucket list uh i've long wanted to visit japan okay um, well we know I, that don't we with the well, there you go, yeah. ninja and <laughs> swords <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't go. That should be in my passport block or somewhere. <laughs> my, my girlfriend's terrified about the food situation over there. She's watched too many episodes of Top Gear where okay. Richard Cameron couldn't eat in any country beyond like South Africa. What, um, what was it? Yeah. She should watch, um, what's his name? James, um, oh, I've forgotten his name from, from Top Gear. Yeah, James May does. He goes to Japan. Have you watched yeah, that? I've watched, I haven't. I've seen the Italian one. You've just got really, to watch it. You've got to watch it. It's <laughs> brilliant. It she's got to watch it. She would love it. If she's if she's um, worried about it, he goes. It, it's it's just a wonderful piece of, of that, TV. Uh, honestly, worth knowing. Yeah. So that's been that's been right up my bucket list for a long time. Is to just go and visit Japan and be in that like totally different culture. It's, yeah. Yeah. I it can't is. Think of anything that's more opposite to yeah. my life than yeah. what I see there, and I'd love to go and see that. Yeah. Um, I've got a long-term desire to live in Italy. Yes, it sounds like it. <laughs> so I would love to be able to make that come to life at a certain point in time. Um, and I, you know, as as an old petrol head, I've got a long-term desire to own an old Ferrari. Oh, fantastic. Um, but maybe I'm in the wrong career for that. I don't know. <laughs> Not that for me so far. Apparently well, crypto is the way, according to my Oh, job. well, that, that's what they all say. But every week I hear it's gone down. Um, apart from coffee and wine um, and food, but what what is a guilt? What is a guilty pleasure of yours that that you feel like? Oh, I, you know, that's something I couldn't do without. <laughs> Probably podcasts. No. <laughs> a guilty pleasure. I can't, I can't think of one else. No, no, don't, don't worry. Don't worry. Else obsesses me. What what book did you most recently finish? Um, actually, one of my favorite authors, a guy called Con Igledon, nobody okay. does historical drama like this guy. He's incredible. Ah. I mean, read read his series. On I'm going to write that down right now. Con Con Igledon, I double G U L D E N, and I stumbled okay. onto him because I've got a massive obsession with Julius Caesar. I think it's just incredible. Right. The Roman Empire is an amazing. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. So I read that. He does a brilliant mm-hmm. series on Genghis Khan mm-hmm. and the story of you know that part of the world and Mongolia. Mm-hmm. Um, and various others. Luckily, we publish him. So, I oh, I, so you're I, very I, lucky I to read them. <laughs> so, I've just I've just read a book called Lion, which is the story of Greece and Sparta and Macedonia. Ah, oh, fascinating! Another, another historical series based yeah, around yeah, yeah. a soldier-based character. But Brilliant. the guy just brings it to life in a way that I'm totally immersed in. I can't put it down. So, yeah, it was that wonderful. That was, I finished that yesterday. Now I need a new book. Well, there you go. Where well, you got a whole publishing company? I've got a lot to choose from. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it, if you could go back in time, what would you tell your 16-year-old self? Oh, mm. 
probably to be more confident actually yeah um, yeah yeah just to understand that yeah you everybody has strengths yeah you need to find your strengths mm-hmm. and and major on them you know one of the i had a brilliant boss for a period of time called helen My- helena miles and we did one of those psychological tests, but rather than the "you're terrible at this," how can you be um, you know, decent? Mm-hmm. Cover the gaps, basically. Yep. She used the strength finder approach, which okay. was you know, yep. find find the things you're good at and really maximize on mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. And I think for many people growing up, you always get told the things you're not good at. You, you <laughs> less often get told the things that you're amazing at. And I think yep. if you can, if you've got something or some way or someone who can tell you what you're good at and how to make the most of that, you know, like this ability to communicate, which I'm hoping or I believe has powered me to the position I'm at now, mm-hmm. to some of my peers, then lean into that yeah, and, yeah. and maximize it. And, and at the time, nobody was telling me that. But I, and I learned that by myself. So be reflective on situations. I've learned a lot from what I've done wrong and I'm willing to sit down and think on that. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, find the things you're good at and really push on them. Mm-hmm. If you could switch lives with one person for a day, who would it be? <laughs> Quite a lot of my heroes are dead. So I'm not going to choose. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> I don't know. There's another question about that later. So, All right, uh... then. let's not try and answer that one. <clears throat> um, I don't want to be too worthy on this and say something that is inauthentic, um, but you know, a bit Miss Universe type thing. So I would probably say that I would love to experience the life of of someone like a guy i recently met um in miami carlos Sainz, um you know the formula one driver just happened to be staying in the same hotel as me uh-huh. uh, and i would love to get in the seat of that formula one wow. car and come around yeah. the racetrack for a day oh my uh, goodness and, and just see what it feels like to be young and fit and agile and and in control of an absolute missile like Oof. that so i'd quite yeah. like to get that. Yeah. yeah that is yeah well you are a petrol head aren't you yeah What's, <laughs> I know you've said earlier on you weren't adventurous or you haven't done adventurous things like not you weren't adventurous, but what's one thing, perhaps, is there something you've always wanted to try, but you've been a bit scared to do so? Oh, well, I don't like your phraseology for a start. Okay. (laughs) Um, But I I tell you what, absolutely, I find amazing two things related to the same thing. So because my dad was in the uh, in the aircraft industry, I always wanted to be a pilot. Yep. And I always felt like my my eyesight let me down. And so I okay. got the interest, but it never stopped my fascination with flying. Mm-hmm. You know, so early dreams of being Superman and being conditioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I didn't hurt myself too much with that one. <laughs> but when I look at two things, one is the guy who invented gravity, not didn't invent gravity, but gravity, the company with the jetpacks. Uh-huh. Yeah, and brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, is it Richard Newton? Uh, Richard I, Brown? I, I, I Richard can't Brown, remember maybe. his name. Yeah. But he inspires me because it's yeah. incredible he's built there through perseverance and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other is the guys who have got those like um kite based gliding oh gosh where they just literally the wingsuits yeah and yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You, there's a there's a great piece of well two great pieces of footage one the guy in dubai who's got a wingsuit and the jetpacks yeah. he's kind of rising above the skyscrapers i just find incredible wow the other i think is in somebody doing like a red bull type thing in china yeah yeah, yeah. he's got yeah. the wingsuit and he's going down this canyon he's, yep Yep, uh, and I'm like, well, that must be just incredible. That must be awesome, flying Maverick like that. without the safety of the steel yep. shell. How awesome well, is it? He's still got his parachute with him. Yeah, he's <laughs> yeah. not a okay. real hero. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most ridiculous fact that you know? I, I, I don't know. I can't answer nope. that. Okay, no That's problem. Too ridiculous. <laughs> Let, let's go on. If you could resurrect one person from history. And put them in the world today. Who would it be? I think I have. I think I might know who it was. <laughs> yeah, but I think they were like megalomaniacs, and yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I would love to bring back Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah, uh, that, guy, that guy's guitar capability oh, okay. not taken way too soon. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Who yeah. knows what I'd be listening to now if he could have carried on yeah. expressing the power he had in his fingers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's the one thing you wish you knew at the age of nineteen? Um, I don't know. That's that kind of goes a bit back to the um, the piece of advice at mm-hmm. sixteen. Isn't it, really, I think it's just that you, there are there are things you're good at, you know, and and just believe in yourself. Yeah, and you know, doing those if, and follow those paths, and good things will come to you. Yeah, yeah. If you could offer one piece of advice 
to upcoming data leaders, what would it be? It, it would be to understand that data leadership is not around being like solely interested in data technology. Um, the technology is fascinating and the opportunity mm -hmm. is great. But if the data isn't applied to a situation, then you're a data expert and there are all sorts of amazing, useful things you can do. But you know, data leaders typically are leaders in an organization. Um, so unless you can tie what you can do to mm -hmm. the outcomes of the organization whatever they may be then actually your skills are not that interesting yeah. then you become in in the sort of data philanthropy where yeah. you're bringing incredible insight to the world and that's got all sorts of value but there are mm -hmm. there are a lot fewer of those people and they're relying on data surf from other characters i think in the meantime mm -hmm. so if you're going to be a data leader in an organization then you have to put your data stuff you know to one side of your brain and be as interested in how people are using that to drive their organization forward Yep. Yep. Great answer. Where was the best vacation you've ever taken? I think it has to be Italy. <laughs> uh, how else, How could it not be from what I've been saying? Um, so, okay. Time. Based on that then, which yeah. city is your favorite city in Italy or your favorite Venice. place? Venice. Venice. If I we, won the lottery today, I'd be going and buying the I'm telling you, there's way too many similarities. I go there every year. Way the too thing, many similar. Yeah, I love it. Well, for the I, biennial. Well, for the biennial, is, my wife and I go there. I'm going for New Year. This oh, you year. are? Oh, we've done New Year's as well. I love I it. I need some for you. <laughs> the, is, the problem is, yeah. Venice doesn't have cars. No, you know, I like there's that. A, there's a, well, I do as well, and that's what yeah. makes it unique. And one of my favorite holiday destinations is a Croatian island called La Pud, and it's it's small. So Wh like which island? La Pud, L-O-P-U-D. Where's that? It's just off Dubrovnik. It's about 30 the minutes from Dubrovnik. Okay. But it's a car-free island. Okay. Uh, and when you hit there, you get on a speedboat, you travel across. There's like two hotels, four kilometers square. It's a pretty small place. Okay. But the sense of relaxation um, that comes from a totally different way of getting around, because nothing's too far, so you don't need transport, really. Uh, and therefore, the place is configured, like Venice, is configured for a different lifestyle. Right. Just, it kicks you into a different gear and i find both of those places both relaxing and stimulating as a result of my my favorite thing you know v12 engines sucking down the world mm -hmm. taking us to mm -hmm. a client a destiny um ah, isn't there so, so you know i love uh, them. i know where it is now yeah it's it's yeah. above dubrovnik yeah yeah. yeah 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 so it's 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 um the next uh, island down from shipan yeah yeah that's right yeah because i i was i was in brach last week I, I I've been going to Croatia for the last fifteen years, so but I've never gone to that island. So oh, uh, I totally recommend it. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to speak get to my the, wife about on that the one. posterior. Yeah, the yeah. Goes between the islands. Get off of the yeah. <laughs> but even better, like Venice, even better overnight when the tourists are gone. Oh yeah, it's just you people who live there in September. The pace best time to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what was the best lesson your parents ever taught you? <laughs> I don't think I have one. Isn't that no? terrible? I hope my parents never <laughs> listen to this. <laughs> I kind of feel a lot of ways I learn in spite of my parents. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that, that that that's equally just just as good. You you had a good uh, worldly upbringing. <laughs> so, what what's your favourite food? Uh, I often think of this as my death row meal. Um, so, what would I have if death I was facing row death row? Meal. Um, I, was, I thought, did I hear that correctly? <laughs> no, no, you did. Um, it, and I read a John Grisham book last week on somebody on death row for ten years, and I think about their last meal. Okay. And I, I veer between um, a really good steak and a bottle uh -huh. of red wine, uh -huh. and something that I, I'm absolutely obsessed with, which is spaghetti or linguine alla vongoli. So you know, oh, baby clams. Simple, love simple it. Meal. Yes. But you get a pile of that in front of you with little flecks of chili and basil. Yes. And yes. Clams. Oh dear God! Oh I my goodness! It. Yes, well, yeah. I'm telling you, we're we're very very similar, which is really <laughs> really bizarre. Um, right. Apart from this, but what has been your favorite podcast up to date? Um, do you have a favorite podcast that you go you know listen to every day? Or I don't listen to many. Um, mostly, I'm going back and make sure I've made a total fool of myself. So <laughs> if I've been on one, then that stream is the one at the time um i think um 
I've enjoyed some of the stuff from um, Carinium. Um, Catherine oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, yeah. I've, I've done that, obviously, so mm -hmm. I did go there. But I, mm -hmm. I really like the way that she mm -hmm. structures the podcast and therefore yep. that comes to life. And the other one that I enjoy um, is a guy called Laszlo who does the data storytellers. Okay. Don't know. Um, I think he's based in Canada. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, a different conversation. It's not like a series of questions. It's more like a big inspiration thing. Yeah, um, that's why I really like oh, the opportunity cool. just to expand on the subject. So those those two are probably the ones I would call out right now. Okay. Apologies for anybody else who I've been no, on. I'm sure there's so the many. Hub, you know, sorry, Jason, I haven't <laughs> mentioned that. I, I will just mention I am still the most downloaded episode of the Sinister CDO Hub podcast. Oh, fantastic! The role there of the go. chief data officer. Perfect. So over episodes later, I'm still we'll, we'll have to one. see if we can get that dumb here on this one as well. Absolutely. <laughs> <Get in there. laughs> What's a movie that made you cry? Make me cry. I'll tell you what, uh, I think maybe 12 Years a Slave. Oh, yes. I think that's the name of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so sometimes, you know, things that are, you're aware of but outside your realm yeah. are put so forcefully in your face mm -hmm. around the levels of human depravity that you can't help but sit and go, how, how did this ever happen? It happened. Yeah, um, exactly. It was just an incredibly yeah. powerful piece of storytelling, yeah. I think. And, and yeah, that genuinely Agreed. got to me. Mm. What would you say is your biggest inspiration? Or who, sorry, who would you say is your biggest inspiration? Uh, I carry, uh, when I when I left, um, you know, my, my last major employer and went out by myself as a data consultant and strategist, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I had a pen from Mont Blanc from their JFK series. Mm -hmm. And I, I had an inscription put on it, which was you know, basically nothing happens if you don't try it. Yep. So, uh, I think, I think in many ways, um, JFK probably in yeah. some way. But the person who I listen to mm -hmm. and makes my hair stand on end still is Barack Obama. Okay. Uh, the, the, there's, I mean, a I do a lot of presenting, and if I mm -hmm. could present and all yeah. the that he does, mm -hmm. I would, I'd be a millionaire by now. And that Ferrari in house, <laughs> he would be well sorted. <laughs> but I think also what he was saying, yeah, uh, the way he was saying it, but also the content of what he offers. Yes. Um, I still find him one of the most inspirational mm -hmm. and, and I will pick up um, a podcast or actually go to YouTube and, and get that yes we can speech mm -hmm. listen mm -hmm. to that on my headphones mm -hmm. and it just mm -hmm. my skull tingles yeah wonderful um, what's the one talent you wish you had oh well that's going to be the guitar yep. <laughs> yeah yep. I mean, if I could pick that up and play I'd be happy <laughs> do you have a favourite exercise apart from biking I think, uh, cycling yeah so i do do that yeah. but not as i should but i do yeah. love it, when I do it um otherwise i go to i go to the gym three you or do. four times a week at the moment oh good for you um, i can't stand gyms that that's where we part i think it's about <laughs> finding one let's not get into this too deep because i'll lecture you about <laughs> the one i found and why i really enjoy it yeah, but, yeah. Um, there are certain exercises that i really enjoy but i think you know as a man obviously watched too many films in the past there's still the like the chest press how much oh yeah, yeah, of yes. course. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there's a constant challenge between me and a friendly challenge in the gym on <clears throat> where we get into with that. It's not enough, by the way. Um, yeah, I do enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I know the I know the 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 answer to the next one, which it which is what's the one data trend that you dislike at the moment? Which I think I know what it is. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Jordan, it's like the, well, you, you yeah. let, let's move on. What's a, what's a superpower you wish you had? Um. I watch a lot of these like programs. Stephen King was a big author for me as a kid. They always had like telekinesis. Yep. So I think probably that is either that or the ability to fly. Uh huh. Very cool. What's the best thing that happened this year? <laughs> can't be too controversial on these things, can you? I always never know who's listening. You can be. Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> you, you, you always represent an organization. Don't you? Oh, <laughs> yes. I forgot about that. Yes, of course. What you you're do. saying. So <laughs> trying not to be too controversial. There are things that have delighted me. Um, how about the women um, in the Euros? Because yeah. I, I went to the men's Euros um, yeah. finals last year, England, Italy. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and it was a terrifying experience. Yeah. I mean, truly terrifying being in that crowd on that day mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. behavior that was going on. Yeah. This seemed like I, I tried to get tickets for this and I failed, mm. but it was a, a more joyous celebration. Yeah, of, wonderful. I think. Yeah. No, that was amazing. Very, 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 very inspirational, for, I think, for a lot of people. But unfortunately, it seems to have uh, been deflated slightly with all of the uh, non investment in sports for 
for girls that I've recently heard about. So much showboating. Yeah. Yeah. On, you know, political aspirations afterwards. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's, it's disappointing. Yeah. You yeah, did a jump on the trail, but yeah. Which which movie makes you laugh the hardest? <laughs> I've been rewatching some Monty Python recently. <laughs> um, Life of Brian and the Holy Grail. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, they they things. do. I quote them all the time. All Blackadder. Yeah. I oh life, yeah. Almost through quoting Blackadder. Fantastic. <laughs> I know it's not a movie, but you know. Do you believe in second chances? Um, depends whether I'm getting it or somebody else is getting it. Okay. For me, absolutely. <laughs> I should always be saying that. What three words best describe your leadership style? Um. So this is quite easy for me. I live and die by. Daniel Pink's motivational theory of right. autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Okay, well, there I've we go. I've started to quote this all the time. So autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Perfect, perfect. What are currently your top three data challenges? Um, literacy, um, you know, getting people to want to be literate mm -hmm. and, then, and then trying to find time to enable them to become so. Mm -hmm. um, the tools and, and relating it to their jobs and making it feel interesting and relevant. Yep. Um. I think there's something there about phraseology as well, but maybe yeah, that's possibly. for another one. Yeah. yeah. Um, then there's going to be appropriate prioritization of opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as you become literate and as people get excited and they come up with ideas, it's having the opportunity to work on the ones that really matter, but also finding a way to make some progress on the others so that people still feel inspired and involved. Mm -hmm. um, I think on one of the broader one that isn't actually my challenge but is harnessing the power of data for good mm -hmm. and i think mm -hmm. there's too much emphasis on the bad things that could be done by mass yeah. use data and activation of things with a specific interest mm -hmm. and i'd like to see a lot more concentration on the things that can be done for good and for purpose helping. driven purpose driven yeah yeah, yeah i agree with that what what are three words to describe living in the uk I'd rather not answer that. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> it's not Italy, I know. Okay, but it's it's more about the currency. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All I'd, right, I'd we won't. We won't. How do you handle pressure in your career? Um, I mean, it's inevitable, so you have to be able to handle it. I think partly um, through humour mm -hmm. um, and trying to make light of situations without removing um you know their their criticality at certain times yeah but understanding yeah. sometimes sometimes there was a there was a guy who used to sit next to when i was a coder and he would always say no people will come up to a desk and say can you do this for me he said no <laughs> and i didn't have that capability because i was like yeah okay i'll try and fit that in and yeah yeah. So, yeah so you know being able to say no with good reason and justification and to control your timeline and not be driven by other people's priorities where they're irrelevant to you, I think is a really important way to yeah. teach this. Um, and then I think it's about having a support network, mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. able to <laughs> give yeah. other people your stress. I mean, True. delegate stress, that's not what I mean. Um, but just to be able to well, talk no, but just, to just to, Yeah, I, I think it's all. important. Yeah, because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there are things that other people will be able to, to see in a very different manner than you might. Um, what did you want to do with your life at the age of 12? Uh, I want, well, I think by then I realized my eyes weren't good enough to be a pilot. So I'd given up on, on doing that. I probably wanted to be a stuntman or an astronaut though. A very I, cool stuntman. Yeah, still not be able to see. But I still knew a Hollywood stuntman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it definitely became, I wanted to be able to like go back in time and drive the Millia Millia. Oh yeah. I mean, the sports car and race across Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. What's something you still like to learn? Um, it's going to be the guitar. I, yep. I've had three or four guitar tutors and it's never actually seated properly in me yet. Still want to know. Yep. You're, <clears throat> you're stuck on an island. You can pick one food to eat forever without getting tired of it. What would you eat? <laughs> uh, it's probably bread. Yeah. I absolutely love bread. Do you know, I was, I was thinking in my head, curly whirly for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> That's your one and not mine. That's Even mine. Yeah. Yeah. Never like those. <laughs> I'd like a flake over a curly burly. <laughs> so a a any kind of bread or is it just uh, <clears throat> bread? Uh, 
I, I think a constant variety of red. Oh, a constant variety. Red yeah. generic. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. when you go on a holiday and you're facing that hotel buffet and you're in somewhere nice and they've got, you know, like local baguettes or French sticks or some sort of rye variant or ciabatta or, you know, focaccia or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just being able to like cruise across bread and not feel the impact on your waistline would be amazing. Yes, yes, yes. I have to stop eating too much of it. But uh, listen, Pete, we've come to the end. It's fantastic to really get to know you. Um, I know we've gone over a bit, 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 but it's been fantastic to to hear you and the person behind the data leader. So thank you very much for coming onto the show. That's all right. It's nice to finish by breaking bread. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Next time we'll either have to do wine or coffee because now i'm really intrigued about the coffee these are both available <laughs> perfect thanks a lot good to yeah, talk cheers take care bye, bye.